Welcome everyone to the second of two webinars hosted by the Lung Health Foundation on medicinal cannabis. My name is Jennifer McKinnon and I am the Senior Manager of Professional Education and Clinical Practice at the Lung Health Foundation. In February 2020, the Ontario Lung Association became the Lung Health Foundation. At the Lung Health Foundation, we are dedicated to ending gaps in the prevention, diagnosis and care of lung disease in Canada. We invest in the future by driving groundbreaking research and giving our patients and their families the programs and support they need. Today's talk is titled, Medicinal Cannabis in Treating Chronic Pain. Before I introduce our speaker, please note that everyone has been muted for the duration of the presentation. Please use the question and answer feature at the bottom of your screen to submit any questions. The presentation will be approximately 40 minutes with five to 10 minutes for questions at the end. It is now my pleasure to introduce our speaker. Dr. Martin Chason is the Medical Director of Palliative Care at William Oslo Health System. He was previously Medical Director of Palliative Care at the Ottawa Hospital Cancer Center and the Palliative Rehabilitation Program at the Elizabeth Bure Hospital in Ottawa. His undergraduate training in medicine and surgery was at the University of Pretoria in 1983. Later, he obtained a specialist degree in internal medicine and medical oncology and a master of philosophy in palliative medicine at the University of Cape Town in South Africa. He is a founding member of the Palliative Care Working Group and faculty member of education at the European Society of Medical Oncology. He holds professorships at the universities of Toronto, McMaster, Ottawa, and McGill. He has in excess of 100 peer-reviewed publications, abstracts, and book chapters. He lectures internationally on cancer patient rehabilitation and approaches to treatment. So I'll turn it over to you, Dr. Chason, if you want to share your screen, and we'll get started. Thanks, everyone. Okay, well, thank you very much to the organizers and for having me here for the second round. Um, for those people that were with us last week, um, there are a few slides which I am going to be using again in order to uh, push forward some of the points that I have for the second part of the, co the communication. So, um, and I would really appreciate some, some questions at the end of all of this so that we can generate some discussion in where this is going forward. So the ideas of what I'd really like to, to bring forward today is to try and get a basic understanding of the endocannabinoid system within the human body and to see what is the function of it, to know what is the existing evidence regarding the use of cannabis and cannabinoids for pain um, and other medical purposes. And of course, to eventually recognize that there are potential side effects, which will uh, um, have uh, subsequent contraindications for cannabis and the cannabinoids. You know, this is a, a relatively new field that we're going into, despite the fact that it's a very old system and uh, lots of it and everybody's known about cannabis. But the actual science of cannabis has really only in about the past 30 years uh, be, uh, come forward. You know, cannabis was a, it was a banned substance. It was told it was bad. And now we see that, in fact, there may be some areas where cannabis um, has great therapeutic potential. And as we move forward in this idea of using natural substances and uh, well, you know, substances that have been used recreationally for decades, um, how to bring them into the scientific use um, and practice the art of using them correctly. So uh, my only disclosure is that I um, am an advisor to Tetra Biofarm and they plan to start a trial. We were hoping to start at the beginning of the year but with COVID, that's all been pushed towards the end. So let's look at what is medical cannabis. It could be dried cannabis. It could be cannabis oil. Um, recently, we're now starting to see the synthetic cannabis uh, cannabinoids come into use, which is more a, an, a, a, a more scientific formulation, which, uh, of which is pure and uh, which we know the exact ingredients on. We know that cannabis has really been used for a very, very long time. And for the people that have come forward, we could see that it's registered, registered users have tripled um, over the past six years. You know, um, chronic pain is probably the most common indication for why people use cannabis. Um, and generally we know that people that use cannabis and people that prescribe cannabis would like to be better informed 
of the workings, the availability, the indications, and the contraindications of cannabis. So we do know that um, the, in, the, the cannabis basically looks with THC and CBD, and THC produces many of the psychoactive adverse effects of cannabis um, smoking or ingestion, and CBD, which is non-psychoactive, um, and it's usually the CBD component that is analgesic, neuroprotective, can be anticonvulsant, anti-emetic, anti-spasmodic, and most importantly, I think, is that it does definitely have anti-inflammatory properties. Now, anti-inflammatory is, is a big news of, uh, because we're now starting to see across the spectrum that many diseases and many side effects and many consequences of whether it's cancer or uh, cardiovascular disease has to do with inflammation. We look at something like, um, like anorexia cachexia syndrome, the CRP, which is C-reactive protein, which is a, a surrogate for the activity of inflammation, is a very important measurement. So inflammation does seem to be playing a role in very many uh, disease processes. The endocannabinoid system, as we explained, is a very old system. And you, the human type cannabinoid receptors actually were seen in invertebrate stage fish, pre-fish evolution. So there's endogenous, which is natural human cannabinoids, and these are molecules that are basically fat soluble and found in the fat. And as we know, the brain has got a lot of fat. So this is where these molecules tend to aggregate is in the fatty nervous system. And if we think about an endogenous opioid system, the morphines, the, end of the, the, the opioid receptors, and how we could use these opioid receptors to treat pain because they are naturally occurring so too with the cannabis and the endocannabinoid receptors, we can use them by modulating the amount, by modulating the affinity and the attachment and the activation, we can use cannabis and such like substances in order to modulate those systems. So I'm gonna just show you that uh, CBD1 receptors are prim found primarily in the nervous system and CBD2 in the immune system, they have different functions. Actually, we, we spoke about that earlier, but they do have um, overlap to a wide variety and range of cannabinoids that are used therapeutically. Different species may have a different distribution and a different receptor sensitivity. Comparing, for instance, mo example, a motion regulated part of a, of a rat brain is more sensitive than a human's to cannabinoids. So rats tend to walk along a straight line more crookedly than what humans do if they are stimulated to the same degree by, by cannabinoids. Now, this slide I'd, I'd really like you to, to look in because it's a, to me it's my, one of my favorite slides <clears throat> where I have a look, where are the CB1 receptors? Cerebral cortex, having a look that it, these receptors are involved in decision-making, in emotional behavior. Once again, looking at the chordate nucleus, and I'm looking to, to show you that learning and memory is very important and does have a very important effect, um, which is stimulated and controlled and modulated by the cannabinoids. So we've got memory and learning. We have a look at the putamen. Once again, it's got various types of learning the uh, uh, looking at the amygdaloid nuclei, which is responsible for anxiety and stress, emotion, fear, and pain. And this, if you have a look at anybody with a terminal disease, such as cancer, that's where we've got large amount of anxiety, stress, emotion, fear, and pain. So pain and emotion and stress really go hand in hand um, of one part of a circle holding hands with the next part of the circle. The more pain, the more emotion, the more anxiety. The more anxiety, the more pain. So 
they bring them together and if we could find a panacea of substances like the cannabinoids in order to treat these anxieties and pain, the amygdaloid is where it would be. Looking at the hippocampus, once again, memory and learning. Um, substantia nigra, which is a, in, in, you know, where we've got reward. So this is why cannabinoids do tend to have a favorable effect on people. All of these neuroreceptors inside the brain do play a role. And the last one is just to mention the, the function of emesis of vomiting in the dorsal vagal uh, complex. So cannabinous, we know that the two main types, which is the indica and the sativa, but there are a multitude of other subspecies, just like we see species of different types of tea, and they may look the same, but they smell differently, they may have a different color, they uh, may taste differently. So too with the cannabinoids, because it's a plant, really, it does vary in their different contents of how much THC, how much um, uh, cannabidiol, cannabinoids, and the various other metabolites of which I hear now is in excess of a thousand different types of metabolites that one gets from cannabis itself. I think it would be important now just to give a quick description of the pharmacokinetics of these drugs within the human body, and they depend on the formulation of the drug and the route of administration. And these are the standard pharmacokinetic uh, uh, variables that we look at, the absorption, distribution, metabolism, and elimination. So looking at the absorption, we know that cannabinoids are administered via inhalation, and they exhibit similar ph pharmacokinetics to those that are administered intravenously. Um, so if you breathe in a drug and you can give it intravenously, that the pharmacokinetics actually are very similar. After inhalation, both the plasma concentrations of CBD and THC are attained rapidly. That's within three to, minutes, three to 10 minutes. And maximum concentrations are higher relative to oral ingestion. The bioavailability of THC after inhalation reportedly ranges from 10 to 35%. And this is attributable to the variability, both the intra and the inter-subject variability inhalational characteristics. Because maybe some person takes a bigger puff, takes more regular puffs um, than somebody that's got smaller lungs. Maybe it's also got something to do in the way that drug is being administered. Is it with a, a cigarette or a joint? Is it within a chamber? Is it within a vaporizer? So these are variables which will eventually have an effect on the amount of drug that is, is absorbed. Inhaled CBD was reported to have an average systemic bioavailability of 31% which is really almost the same as that of THC. The pharmacokinetics of vaporized and smoked cannabinoids are relatively comparable. Now, Sativex, which is an abixamol or an oromucal spray, those inhalations undergo rapid absorption by the oral mu mucosa and are hence are helpful to relieve symptoms which need immediate relief. So some of the, these Sativex, they do provide immediate relief because they produce high drug concentrations, relatively higher to then if somebody would ingest it. So you've got an oral mucosa, it's absorbed pretty directly, there's no first pass defect and it goes straight into the blood. Now transdermal uh, administration of cannabinoids avoids the first part effect of the metabolism, but due to the highly extremely um, uh, hydrophobic nature, this limits the diffusion across the aqueous layers of the skin. In vitro studies with human skin have determined that the permeability of CBD is to be tenfold higher than that of THC. 
Cannabinoids distribute relatively well to well vascularized organs like the lung, the heart, the brain, and the liver, with subsequent equilibration into less vascularized tissues. So they have an affinity to go for the well vascularized tissues, as we said, like the heart and the lung, and then after some time, will equilibrate into the other tissues so that an equivalent amount and concentration is achieved throughout the body. But of course, the distribution may be affected by the body size and composition, as well as different disease states, as well as some of the other drugs, which can affect the permeability of the blood-brain barrier. And knowing, of course, that chronic with chronic use, cannabinoids can accumulate in the adipose uh, tissue um, and then are very slowly released. So half-lives may be increased in patients that use these drugs chronically. The metabolism of THC is predominantly via the liver, <clears throat> via a cytochrome P450 or CYP-P450, although there are some other cytochromes that are involved, which you can see the CYP2C9 or the CYP2C19, predominantly excreted in the feces and the urine. They undergo glucuronination, and this is how they get into the urine and into the feces. Important to note is that lipophilic THC is able actually to cross over into the placenta and is then excreted in human breast milk. CBD is really metabolized primarily by the liver, which we see once again, but a different CYP2C19, which is also THC, but it's the third most important, and mainly fecal excretion, although there is some urinary excretion. <clears throat> and interestingly enough, at this stage, very little is known about the pharmacological activity of the metabolites of CBD, which seems to be the less uh, noxious uh, of, the, of, of the THC compounds um, in humans. The estimates of the elimination half-life do vary. That's important, as we'll speak later why this is important, but a first initial half-life, four to six minutes, and then a long terminal half-life of 22 hours. So in a person that does not use the drug chronically, there's a half-life that can last almost a day. In relatively longer elimination half-life is observed in those people that are chronic heavy users, because as I explained, they retain the drug within the uh, adipose tissue, within the fatty tissue, which then is released very slowly into the bloodstream and eventually in term, uh, eliminated. CBD does have slightly longer terminal half-life. We can see that the average half-life following the intravenous dose is about 24 plus minus six hours. And an investigation of repeated daily continuous oral administration actually shows an elimination half-life that can go up to five days which is quite long. The dose response and drug-drug interaction information is unfortunately lacking. And this also plays a big role in interpretation and understanding of clinical trials, is that we don't understand if you give more drug, really does that produce that effect? Or if you give less drug, does it really produce less of an effect? And there is definitely this potential for the interaction um, between either inhibiting or inducing the enzymes um, which, uh, which either break down or prevent the breakdown of the substances or also have an effect on the transporters of the drug within the human body. Both cannabis and tobacco smoking together in, uh, induce the, that, CYP, uh, P, that CYP1A2 and when they smoke together. So this may play a role in whether the effect may be enhanced or may be reduced 
simply by smoking tobacco along with the, um, with the cannabis. Some studies, which are in vitro, reported that CBD significantly inhibits the P-glycoprotein-mediated drug transport. And what P-glycoprotein does is the minute a drug is transported into the cell, the P-glycoprotein, which is actually a resistant type of protein, pumps that active substance out of the cell. We've seen in many of the chemotherapeutic compounds, at, uh, adriamycin, uh, etoposide, these are drugs that are strong inducers of the P-glycoprotein system. And so when patients may become resistant to a drug or their cancer cells become resistant to a drug, it's due to this P-glycoprotein uh, transport. But, um, let's move on. So let's have a look at some of the effects of the, the drug. On the CNS, drowsiness, alertness, impairment of short-term memory. And you saw where that was important when I showed it to you in the brain. Slowed reactions, decreased motor coordination and muscle tone. Accuracy of psychomotor task performance. So one's perception is definitely uh, impaired by the combined effects of these drugs um, working at various structures within the central nervous system. At lower doses, one can get the mild euphoria, the relaxation, the decreased anxiety, which we once again saw where that worked out in the amygdaloid nuclei. Higher doses can increase anxiety and panic reactions. And there have been people, and this is something specifically in the elderly population, where paranoia can, um, can take place. Is it because the people have less fat or maybe the receptors are more sensitive? And once again, the dose response relationship is not quite clear um, in any standard group of people. But we do know that at which dose, we're not sure, but higher doses do tend to cause what we would call in layman's term a bad trip. Of course, the other effects are the pain perception. And I once again say perception because when speaking to these patients, they would say we still feel the pain, but it just isn't as important or doesn't affect me as emotionally or it doesn't have an effect on my functional status as it did when I did not take the drug, but we still feel the pain. Of course, anti-nauseant and anti-emetic effects by the CB1 receptors uh, meant to increase appetite, which it does in healthy volunteers. Unfortunately, in all the trials so far being done, actual appetite has not been increased. But in a trial that we did uh, to, you know, 2012-13, what we found was taste perception was altered. And, uh, and uh, also dysgeusia, which is um, abnormal tastes, distorted tastes is, is decreased. So patients found that they tasted food better, they wanted more of it, but it didn't really have an effect on the appetite and the so-called munchies, which we were all hoping patients with advanced cancer and anorexia cachexia would have, um, has not unfortunately materialized. Now, there is some reports of anticonvulsant effects um, with, with these drugs, but it's not via a CB1 receptor. And I think that is important to know. On the neuromuscular system, we've got antispasmodic effects, and this has been well utilized in some of the drugs with spasticity and even recommended for pain and spasticity of patients that have multiple sclerosis. Cardiovascular effects, patients uh, get their hearts beat faster, they have a better cardiac output, but it also induces a myocardial oxygen need. So if a patient has narrowed arteries in their heart and they suddenly need more oxygen because their heart is beating faster, then they may experience angina. Respiratory, it does increase bronchodilatation. And there were very many old people, um, and I still remember this in South Africa, who would actually take marijuana in order to treat their asthma. And uh, 
but they would not take it with cigarettes. It would just be pure marijuana and that would increase the, uh, decrease the airways resistance, allow them to breathe the air out much easier and cope with the effects of asthma. Bronchial irritation <coughs> and of course cannabis smoke is similar to tobacco smoke as far as irritation goes, um, but the evidence for any obvious causing of lung cancer is lacking. Eyes, patients get you know, dilatation probably from the heart, um, the heart that's beating faster, the blood pressure that goes up. And yet again, we come back to this old albatross, which always seems to come back at us, is what is the effect on immune function and how does it stop the immune uh, response or the, the overt immune response? Because as we know very often, the immune response that we see in patients with cancer has been ineffective. In fact, with the new uh, inhibitors, the break, checkpoint inhibitors, they turn in off some of that immune function and patients are actually doing better. So the old story of, well, you need a fever to fight an infection may not actually be true. So cannabinoids do have an effect on the immune function, although it's unclear exactly. So those were the acute effects, and let's look at some of the chronic effects, cognitive changes, verbal fluency, learning deficits. These are people that are taking high doses and can get a chronic intoxication syndrome of apathy. You know, we don't feel like going to school. We don't feel like doing homework. We don't feel like playing sport. We don't feel like socializing. We just feel like sitting in our room. This has been a, one of the big problems that they found with younger users who have been using it chronically is this chronic apathetic syndrome. Now, whether that's just as the newer generation is or whether this is in fact what was seen in many older generations when they were younger, it is an entity. And there is a cannabis dependent um, categorization on the DSM-4 and we'll go through those a little later. But the chronic effects on the uh, respiratory system is chronic inflammatory chest diseases, um, and those include the COPD, the chronic obstructive airways diseases, where once again, inflammation is a big role, plays a big role. We know that steroids, whether inhaled or whether oral, given orally to patients that have these inflammatory diseases do play a role and it's to, in, to decrease the inflammation. Just uh, if, say, speaking of some effects that um, are specific to CBD and not to THC, there's reduction in the, they may cause a reduction in the, the, in the THC associated adverse effects, um, specifically the psychotropic and the cardiovascular effects. So that CBD may in fact counteract the effects of THC um, inherently. But of course, CBD has been reported with fatigue and somnolence. It does, you take it at night, it does help people to go to sleep. But chronic long term users, because they're not excreting the drug, may become overtly somnolent and fatigued. And of course, if they use it with other medications. There's limited data regarding the safety and efficacy of cannabis in the elderly population. Um, and this is because we know that in the context of the elderly, there's, there's associated comorbidity, there's polypharmacy, there's increased cognitive vulnerability and predisposed to more severe manifestations from the drug such as sedation. We also know that the pharmacokinetic parameters uh, are influenced by age, such as reduced hepatic and renal clearance and relative decreases in body fat. So some of the drug may remain active for longer periods of time. And in fact, I've had two patients that have both been elderly that suffered this acute um, toxic syndrome where they became extremely paranoid and uh, they had a really bad trip and confused. Medical cannabis can be administered through different uh, techniques and uh, methods such as smoking, vaporization and ingestion. And the vaporization uh, produces effects that are very similar to smoking, 
but it's while reducing the exposure to the byproducts of the combustion and possible carcinogens, which then decrease the adverse respiratory sy sy syndromes. No clear association in a number of reviews that looked at the pulmonary effect of smoking and the association between cannabis and lung cancer. <coughs> and the conclusion of many of these studies that there is no clear association or only a marginally statistical significant association. These are the three types that we've seen specifically in Canada, but although we don't have the dronabinol anymore, that was the oral form of uh, the synthetic uh, Delta 9 THC, nabilone sesamate, which is, is available and is treated for severe um, chemotherapy-induced nausea and vomiting, and the nabiximols, the sativex, which has been used, and I will speak a little bit about this later, as the adjunctive treatment for patients with symptomatic relief of spasticity uh, with, with multiple sclerosis or in neuropathic pain, or in patients with advanced cancer who experience moderate or severe pain during the time that they're taking as much tolerated dose of strong opioid that they can. Uh, just to go into a subject of the problem designing clinical trials is that there's no data or almost no data on the pharmacokinetics during the chronic treatment. We know that there's a longer half-life and therefore a big greater risk of accumulation and the monitoring of these levels needs to be done regularly. So we don't have data on that to know enough to go into a clinical trial with patients that have been using it for quite a while. As well, the distribu distribution between the plasma and the tissue may invalidate ordinary methods of measurement of bioavailability. So the distribution is not understood. Um, the accumulation is not fully understood. And we do know that the cannabidiols is an effective if it's inhibitor if it's given acutely, and yet it's an inducer if used chronically of the P54. And so there's this <coughs> increased risk of using an interaction with other drugs, whether it's smoking, or, um, and it applies mainly to the smoking cannabis, but not to the pure cannabinoid treatment. So there's a difference once already. Many people have claimed indications for therapeutic use, which is a lifelong use, not just a, an acute use and then over, but more lifelong. So we have to consider, of course, that using these drugs may cause pulmonary damage, it may cause tolerance and you have to increase the dose. And of course, there is, although it's small, there is a risk of dependence. The safety margin, you can get somebody using the same amount of drug and yet the one person freaks out and the other person tolerates the drug just quite calmly. So there's this therapeutic range that, uh, that can occur, therapeutic effect that can occur within the same, the, the same dose range. Subjective effects um, are noticeable within seconds or minutes when smoking cannabis, whereas an accumulative effect is noted in chronic treatment. So these are some of the difficulties in designing clinical trials. Another thought is what would actually be measured? We need objective rather than just subjective need to qualify. You know, when you look at nausea, are you nauseous, yes or no? How bad is the nausea is more difficult to determine, even pain. On a scale of zero to 10, where 10 is the worst pain and zero is no pain, where is your pain? How much is your pain? May be different from person A to person B. So also the importance of the placebo effect requires very accu accurate measures of responses. And who does the measurement of those effects? We know that most patients that are taking these treatments have smoked the, uh, the, the, or taken the cannabis for so long that they in fact are advocates because they say it's worked so well for them. So who's going to measure those effects? People that have not taken it are really what we need. Difficult in today's times. The number of available subjects for some real indications may actually be too small for proper evaluation. So we do need multi-center studies where people 
are working together with similar types of patients, standardizing who's eligible, who's not eligible, who gets the drug, how that drug is effect is measured, and whether the patient is compliant, whether the family is compliant. And for many potential indications, cannabis would have to be supplementary to other treatments. So you're treating pain, you should be treating um, you know, with, with opioids, and you're treating with the cannabis, not just with the cannabis. So this does play a difficult role. And what will the fate be for these trials if new therapies under development suddenly come along? And we have now seen new inhaler units that are going to be for non-smoked cannabinoids. So how are we going to compare what, what the data that we have to some of the new data that we have? And, and how are we going to actually better separate therapeutic and side effect um, from, the, from the drugs? So let me just give you a background of some of the work that I'm going to go, and that's really about chronic neuropathic pain, which we know affects about 1% to 2% of the population, and patients with chronic and pain have reported using smoke cannabis to relieve pain, improve sleep, as well as to improve mood. So what they did in this study by Mark Weir is they treated adults who had post-traumatic or post-surgical neuropathic pain to receive cannabis at four potencies, either at 0%, 2.5%, 6%, or 9.4% for over 14 days in a crossover trial. Participants inhaled a single 25 milligram, milligram dose through a pipe three times daily, and the first five days in each cycle, followed by a nine-day washout period. And then the daily average pain intensity was measured using an 11-point numeric rating scale. They recorded the effects on mood, sleep, quality of life, as well as adverse effect. And they only recruited 23 patients, of whom 21 completed the trial. The average daily pain intensity measured on the scale was lower. Uh, and it did to be significant, whereas patients, and this was mainly for the patients that took the higher 9.4% dose versus the 0% dose. Preparations with the intermediate potency yielded intermediate but non-significant results. But also, those patients taking the higher dose had improved ability to fall asleep, it was easier, it was faster, and they had improved quality of life. But no differences in mood or quality of life in the lower doses was noted. And these are some others. In the, in the particular trial, they once again compared it, and what they saw was once again that the average daily pain intensity measured on this 11-point numeric rating scale was lower, but, and the preparations with the intermediate potency yielded intermediate results that were not significantly. But no CBD was in any of the products tested. There was an improvement in the quality of sleep and a significant improvement in anxiety. So overall, some of the components of, quality, of the quality of life of patients was improved. Very small trial, only 23 patients. In this randomized placebo crossover, crowd controlled crossover trial in cannabis cigarettes in neuropathic pain, we see that there were 38 patients, non-naive, and they got different doses. And they were delivered as two puffs, followed by three puffs, followed by four puffs, at one hourly intervals. So a different methodology. What they saw was there was significant improvement in pain and pleasantness. Once again, the perception, and there was no change in the allodynia, which is a, a exaggerated pain or response to heat and worsening of attention, learning and memory with active treatment. So, Getting a little bit of better pain control, although the perception is 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 uh, the perception is altered, but pain a price with decreased attention, learning, and memory. In HIV-associated neuropathic pain, we know that despite management with opioids and other pain-modifying techniques, 
neuropathic pain continues to reduce the quality of life and daily function in patients that have HIV. Um, this trial was done a little bit ago, to say 10, 11 years ago, when HIV was still very much in the news. And what they did as well was a double-blind, placebo-controlled crossover for 34 patients. They had to be refractory to at least two previous, previous analgesic classes. They got different variety of doses ranging from 1% to 8% over five days, followed by a washout period. They were smoked, um, and it was a phase two trial. And what they found was that uh, the outcome was a change in the pace, pain intensity measured on a descriptor differential, differential scale from a pre-treatment baseline to the end of each treatment week. And they also looked at mood and daily functioning. So what they found was 46% of subjects at least had a 30% reduction in pain. But they, the clinical trial um, that they conducted was only a phase two, uh, phase two trial. So it was not really something that they could take forward. And in, as well is that most side effects that they experienced were mild and limited. But there were two subjects who really had bad side effects, and they had to stop the drug. Just looking at chronic pain, and this is in a, uh, it was published in uh, 2006, looking at the different um, uh, eff efficacies of the different drugs, look at opioids, 58% said they got treatment relief. Now it's 21% relief, um, up to 6.3. Uh, so that was the improvement within minutes, within hours, within days, and within weeks, who still had pain relief after weeks? 2% still had a pain relief after two weeks, 5% after a few days. And looking at the cannabinus, 0% after weeks, just three after days, and 80% after hours. So cannabinoids do play a role. There's no doubt that they play a role. Just looking at the different one, whether it's massage or acupuncture or biofeedback, I don't like the fact that, mag that cannabis has been put along all of these complementary and alternative therapies, as I do feel that there is a, a definite scientific um, role for cannabis in treatment of patients with pain, but we're not sure of the mechanism as yet. So looking at the evidence as we see it, um, there are not many studies because of Health Canada restrictions. A lot of legal Non-inhaled product is available and will be available, but it's now available. There's extensive anecdotal experience from patients worldwide, but we still feel that the cart has been put ahead of the horse. There's a large proportion of patients who are using medical cannabis um, are benefiting, but it may be potential, potentially harmful. It, by uninformed use, it's definitely, it definitely can be uh, intentionally and harmful. And we need to know what works for which disease, what doses, how is it best taken in, what are the other safety concerns before it can be put forward as a true standard tested treatment. We don't know the dose. Is it 2.5? Is it 2.7? Is it 9%? Is it three to five drops? which is the most common use. And um, it's what remembering, of course, that what you see on some of the labels is not what you find in the actual product. And I remember, so I think it was last year that they, the Health Canada did a swoop on all the marijuana stores and found that many of these, these bottles had the wrong labels and there was an infestation of, of parasites. So we have to know what we're looking at and we have to be sure that it's a standard treatment for a standard disease. Can one drive? Well, not after four hours is what's recommended. Um, if you smoke or if you, if you eat it or, or take it in by mouth, not after six hours. But one can have um, a euphoria which can last that long. Addiction. Cannabis is about 9% compared with cigarettes, which is 32% addiction, addiction rate, alcohol of 15, heroin 23, and cocaine 17. 
was just interesting to see that heroin is less than cigarettes. Um, so you can get an ex experience, a, a nicotine-like withdrawal once stopping the cannabis. Is it for people that have smoked nicotine and cannabis together, or is it as true as what it says? We're not quite sure. And you need to be alert that you can have a cannabis use disorder um, that can occur under circumstances similar to opioids. We've spoken about the fact that at this stage, there's no formal uh, uh, proof that smoking cannabis induces cancer. So, in summary, cannabis is a plant. We need a lot more research. It's about what we think where the opioid poppy was 50 years ago. It's not snake oil. It doesn't work for everything. Some diseases and some symptoms, it may work. And for some, it may work better. We've got to look at the young people and the, the chronically ill and the, the older people, not only mentally ill, but older people who have volume distribution problems. Um, Try not to smoke, rather take the oil. And if you're going to go on a trial, let's start the trials that start low and go slow. But please advise people to participate in the clinical trials so that we can move this forward. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Chasen. Um, I'll just remind people to submit their questions. At the bottom of the screen, you can um, just go to the icon saying Q&A. We do have a couple of questions that have come in, Dr. Chasen. Um, okay. and, and one thing I, I thought we'd start with is, um, and you did mention this on your slides, you were talking. Um, what I'm wondering if you could speak a little more about is um, the key priorities for researchers right now, like in the short term. And you did touch on it, but I thought we'd start with that. Maybe just talk a little bit about that. You know, when you look at them, I think that's a good question because I've thought about that quite a lot. And when I've looked at some of the trials, because I've had many patients that have smoked cannabis and they all do seem to do a little bit better. But when I've asked myself, what is it that they're doing better about? Yes, maybe their pain's a little bit better and maybe they, they, they smell the food better and they enjoy their food a little bit better. And maybe they're not as anxious as what they were before they started smoking the cannabis. And maybe they're not as nauseous as they were before they started smoking the cannabis. And maybe they could breathe a little bit easier now that they've started smoking the cannabis. So it's working across all of those symptoms, not just on one symptom. So I think what we should be measuring is as the patient regards his own quality of life along all, not only this, the symptom sphere, but the emotional sphere, the spiritual sphere, because there are many people that find with the altered perception that they are, they, their spiritual, their soul feeling goes up as well. And, you know, we cannot consider that a human being is just flesh and bones. There's a mind and there's a body. And there's, a, there's another aspect which is probably also playing a role. And those kind of uh, measurements need to be incorporated in order for us to find really where, how this drug is working. Oh, very good. Thank you. Um, so one of the questions that came in from a participant, um, can you comment on brain cell damage and THC? Uh, so this has obviously gone on, you know, uh, because it's fat soluble and because it's, uh, you know, because, because the cannabis does really go into the brain. Now we know that, I don't know the exact number, but millions of brain cells die off every minute. So having a, an external drug going into the brain and sitting there and however it's affecting that metabolism must have an effect. You know, I know that they've pushed hard to say that there's definite brain cell damage, but I haven't found any equivocal proof that, uh, that acute use of, of cannabis causes acute brain cell damage. Um, we know that once a brain cell is dead, it is dead, it doesn't regenerate. So there, there is that if there is going to be enhanced death, then we would expect that, um, you know, that the deterioration would be more rapid. I've not yet found that people that take the cannabis have an increased incidence of dementia, which is something that I would have liked to see, but it may start happening. Remember, of course, that people did not volunteer that they're taking the cannabis. So many people may have taken the cannabis. 
um, and now presenting with dementia, but we don't yet have that association. Okay, thank you. Thank you for that. A couple more questions have come in. So um, how can we compare or discuss dosage? Is it by trial and effect? I think that's what it is. We have to standardize the right dose. Um, medicinal cannabis is difficult to standardize the dose. Synthetic cannabinoids um, is where you know. You, uh, I mean, it's, it's very much like taking the poppy plant and saying, well, we're going to make morphine out of this and we'll give you one poppy plant and you can have two and you can have three. Whereas if you synthesize and get a morphine standard and then you can compare the same doses of morphine with different people. So too it is with cannabis. And I think I do believe that that's the way that it will go scientifically. That the the synthetic cannabinoids, which are pure, firstly, and you know what's the constituent of it, and you can re reliably reproduce the exact amount of dose. That is the way that we will eventually find out what is the correct dose for the for the correct patient. Okay. Perfect. Um, another question from a participant. Some family doctors will not prescribe, so if patients need to or just want to buy commercially versus with a prescription, how do patients ensure that their source is reliable? This is a problem that Health yeah. Canada has. You know, um, it is, you know, there are doctors that don't want to prescribe and we're hoping that these seminars will actually show them that they should. On the other hand, I do know of many clinics that just prescribe. You know, you need to go there and you will be given the drug. Um, I've, I've never been to one of those clinics, but I do know that they're all available and there are physicians. And one would hope that the, if there would be any problems that the patients would be able to go back to those physicians and say, this is the effect that I had are you helping me to monitor it? Are you trying to help me with it? Or are you just handing it out? So um, I think that a lot of the pain clinics will be doing that. Was as I said, the majority of it is pain, but I think the value of, of the cannabis is a lot more than the pain. I'm of the belief that you're treating the whole person with cannabis. And so you should be looking at the whole person, not just measuring the pain or the nausea, the vomiting, but how does that person find themselves within the, in their family? Are they feeling that they, they've still got a role? Is there meaning in, in living or not? You know, uh, is it, are you making a contribution to society? That gives you meaning. Smoking cannabis may change that alteration from somebody feeling that, they, you know, that, they, that they're a victim and they could become a victor by changing that they've got meaning in their life. So measure, measurement of the effect of cannabis is not so straightforward. Okay, very good. Um, so another question, um, and this is specific to something you mentioned in your presentation. Why did the neuropathic pain studies use THC rather than CBD? Okay, so that, remember that was taken a long time ago. I think that part in the past year, a few years realized that's not only CBD, as I said, I think there's about 1600 different components that they discovered. But at that stage, that was what they were looking at. And we're looking more at the THC than what the CBD is. Yeah. Okay. But I would do that study again with CBD in order to see what the results were. But remember, it was just very small, just like less than 30 patients. So. Okay. Very good. A couple more questions still. Um, okay. Before prescribing cannabis for a patient, do you require the patient to sign a cannabis agreement? And if yes, can you share your agreement? I mean, maybe there's a template out there already, but... Um, they're asking specifically um, what you do. I, I've never, I've never uh, had a patient sign an agreement. There may be patients that are on other kind of uh, heavier drugs where, you know, that they do sign an agreement. I know some of the opioid uh, dependent patients sign this agreement if they take the methadone. You know, it, the dependency is really so, it, it's really negligible compared to, you know, even just a cigarette or alcohol. So I've, I've never had a patient that's become physiologically dependent, perhaps psychologically dependent, uh, one, which I think is probably more of a problem than actual physical dependency. So no, I've, I've never had a patient sign an agreement. Okay. Um, we have time for just a couple of more questions. It's um, almost five to one. So just a couple more questions, Dr. Chasen. Okay. Uh, can you comment on psychosis and THC? So not, not a direct question, a very, but a Very, very real, very real. Watch out for the people over 65. 
the 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 people with a you know with with very little body fat they may be chronically ill have never been exposed to drugs or you know any type of alterations or have a history of dependency or a history of psychiatric illnesses or a history of having or even the patients having mild delirium those are the patients I would not give this drug to um, I have seen little old ladies almost jump off buildings I've had two patients that are you know I won't, I won't do it again. I saw it twice and I won't do it again. So that it's very, very real. And when prescribing it, watch out for the elderly, frail person. Okay. Um, someone asked about complaints around intestinal colic. Um, is, is that a common side effect? Or they didn't really specify in the question what they're asking? Or just how I've, common? I haven't seen it written and I haven't had any patients telling okay. me they've, they've had that. I wonder okay. why it would affect that. Okay, well, thanks. No, for, I don't know about that. Thanks for addressing that. Um, you mentioned variables, but is there a recommended maximum daily dose? That's probably hard we to say. Know. We don't know those we things yet. Know. We don't know. I would be very scared to go above the 9.4 percent, though. Okay. Okay, I'll, I'll leave it uh, to this being the last question. Is there a true CBD only option? And if so, does it also produce? Uh, you know what I saw? I saw an advert actually come through one of my emails the other day that there is a true CBD option that's now available in, in, in Canada. I don't know it. It's, it's hemp. Hemp is what CBD is. Um, and it's a pure hemp. Um, is it going to work? I would hope it's going to work. You don't need a you don't need a prescription for it. That's what that's what this advert said to me. Um, but I think that the, I think that the, there is an amount of therapeutic val validity for the THC as well. So whether it's just CBD, but once again the the psychosis that it, you have to be careful. You've got to be careful. Okay. The history or there's any slight dementia or any previous reaction to some of the psychoactive drugs. No ways. Don't do it. Okay, very good. Um, so we are approaching the, um, the end time. So we're close to one o'clock. I just want to say to participants, thank you for joining and asking questions today. Um, it's great to have you. And thank you, Dr. Chasen, for your presentation and taking thank time to be much. with us. We are sending a survey out to participants after this. So those of you who, are, um, who have registered and participated, you'll get a short survey. If you could just give us your feedback and, if, and let us know if there are any other topics along this area that you might be interested in. Um, so you'll see that shortly in your email. So thank you everybody and uh, we'll um, end it there. Thanks very much. Thank you very Take much care. to everybody. I enjoyed being with you. I didn't see you, but I enjoyed it. Okay, thanks a lot. Bye. Bye now.